So John, I'm glad we could take some time to talk about Eisenhower, this piece of ground. And I want to start by asking you a, a little bit about the man himself. Eisenhower warned us of the military industrial complex, but he couldn't defuse the Cold War. He signed major civil rights legislation, but wasn't considered a real leader on the issue during his, ter his two terms. What is the lesson to learn from his presidency about any man or woman in the future who occupies the Oval Office? Boy, that's a, that's a big question. And I'm not sure that I'm really qualified to give it an answer that, that would be enlightening or even, <laughs> or even intelligent. Having lived through the Eisenhower days as a very little boy, but I remember them and I remember him, he was sort of a eminence grise. He was sort of in the background all the time in black and white because that's what televisions looked like in those days. Um, and he was sort of a, a, a uncle type, you know, uh, nice and accommodating. And he had that sort of Midwestern accent that made him sort of, you know, accessible. And he he didn't seem to me as a little boy, but even, you know, around, you heard all the grown-ups talking. He didn't seem to really do anything. He just was there. He was the president. And um, it was all very nice. And then Kennedy took over in 1960. And then I was by then a teenager. And so suddenly it was like, oh, a president is really a, a force of nature and somebody who can say things and do things for the world and for the country and for us and change the way things are thought of. And there's a huge future for us now. <clears throat> and then when he was killed, that was that was a, a a big shock to those of us in the younger generation, but I'm sure to the you know everybody. And it changed everything. It changed everything ever since. And ever since, and I've admired many of our presidents, uh, you know, Obama and Carter uh, uh, foremost. Clinton had a shot. He sort of blew it. Um, Reagan worked hard to destroy the country and uh we are still living under the terrible effects of of the reagan presidency the bushes you know anyway i won't go on but eisenhower somehow gets forgotten in all of that so going back to do this play about him which has a wonderful takeoff point and that is and I even remember it, even as a little boy, there was a New York Times Sunday Magazine article just a couple of years, a uh, year and a half after um, he retired from office and Kennedy was now the young president that said a rating of our presidents by 75 historians put together by Arthur Schlesinger mostly Harvard fellows, mostly men, of course. And it ranked all of the presidents up to that moment. And Ike came out number 22 out of 35. And they had their categories, great, near great, average, below average, and failure. Um, and the playwright, Richard Hellison, took that as a as a as a kicking off point for this play. Ike reads this and is offended. He's pissed and he had a temper. And so he's talking on the phone and then later recording his reaction to being ranked number 22 out of the 35 so far presidents. And he talks about what he did, not only, you know, insisting on he'd done great things and what the hell, there is a little bit of that. But then there he gets contemplative and philosophical and starts, and all of this is not exactly with his, using his quotes from things he actually said, but most of it is. Coming from different speeches he gave, coming from things he wrote in his memoirs, coming from recorded um, you know, tapes of his conversations with world leaders and with his staff and, and Congress people. So most of what I say 
as Ike in this play is stuff that he either said or said something pretty close exactly to it. And he reveals an empathy for humanity, a love for people, leading all of those young boys into D-Day, into World War II, saving Europe from Hitler. All of that cost him. It wasn't the, the great military general doing his stuff and yes, bomb them and kill them. It was like a man responsible for all these young people, sending them to do a duty that needed to be done, but that was horrendous and terrifying and difficult and tricky. And they were lucky to get away with as few deaths as they got away with. And he carried the burden of those deaths to his dying day. So you said, what, what are the, the, the main things about him? It would be that more than anything else. Yes, he did do a lot for civil rights. He did that whole confrontation with uh, uh, Faubus, the governor of, of, uh, of um, Arkansas, and had the, you know, got those uh, black students to get into the school and get the mob taken away. He brought in the, the 101st Airborne, the same team that, that landed uh, in D-Day, that, that did uh, the bombing and the, and the prep for D-Day. So he did a lot. And of course, the military industrial complex, he realized what was happening and everything that he said is now coming true. And to the degree that people are conscious of it, it they owe a lot of that to him. I'll shut up and you can ask me another question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I even answered your question. <laughs> we're, we're there. We're there. Well, let me ask you about something that he wrote himself in 1968 in an article called Some Thoughts on the Presidency for Reader's Digest. And he said, on the other hand, I found that getting things done sometimes required other weapons from the presidential arsenal, persuasion, cajolery, mm -hmm. even a little head thumping here and there, to say nothing of a personal streak of obstinacy, which on occasion fires my boilers. <laughs> if he describes himself like that, it seems to me that is a rich starting place for you as an actor in creating the character of Dwight D. Eisenhower. That's absolutely true. The first act of this play talks a lot about his father, who had, uh, you know, difficult times financially, and uh, his mother, who was a, a um, Jehovah's Witness, and uh, was very, very religious, but not in a sort of crazy evangelistic way, rather in taking the actual lessons from religion, from the Bible, and using them in her life and 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 bestowing them on her six sons seven sons actually one died um and and i grew up amongst all these brothers and uh, learned a great deal of humanity from her and a great deal of do your duty do your job everybody has to contribute it's all about hard work and dedication and everybody has to put in their two cents um, from his dad. And he describes those two influences and, you know, uh, they, they come out in the play, in his life, in his descriptions of what he did and how he did them. And that's, uh, that it's, it's deep within him and it reflected itself in, in his presidency. What do you think Richard Hellison has done with this play that is unique amongst other one man shows? Well, I don't know if I can compare this play to other one-man shows. I've seen many of them, but not all of them. Some one-person plays are about the person themselves, a, a celebrity of some kind. Uh, you know, Elaine Stritch jumps to mind. They show up, they sing their songs, they tell you about their life. Here, I got this part, and here I slept with that guy, and I did this, and I did that, and here's my life. And, oh, this song is sort of appropriate. And they sing that song that sort of supports and illustrates what they're talking about, about their own life. Now, that can be fascinating. And you clearly and saw it, Liberty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <clears throat> that can be great. <clears throat> The first one I ever saw was Julie Harris doing the Bell of Amherst. 
And that was beautiful that she recited all those poems. She enacted the role. She played the part of, of Emily Dickinson. So that was a very different kind of thing. She wasn't being personal about herself. And that was mesmerizing, beautifully written and beautifully performed by her. Of course, I saw Hal Holbrook's Mark Twain. And, you know, he did that for 40 or 50 years. He started as a young man gluing on all the old age makeup. And, you know, he had a voice and he did it. Uh, and then when he was old, he just sort of, I think he didn't shave. And there he was. He was Mark Twain. Um, but he changed it a lot and he used quotations from Twain and he would, you know, use different ones at different times, depending on how he felt at the moment. Um, but the one that I didn't see that I would have loved to was um, Harry Truman, who, who played that. That was um, James Whitmore. Give James him, Whitmore. Give him hell, Harry. Give him hell, Harry. And I heard that that was fantastic. I didn't see it. But. This is probably more in that vein. And it's a big challenge because how do you show in any kind of believable or acceptable way a president or ex-president standing somewhere and talking to you about himself without sort of orating and, and you know, uh, uh, self-aggrandizing. And Richard, the playwright, found this this hook this magazine article where he could talk about other presidents compare himself sometimes very humbly and very realistically sometimes a little you know uh, conceitedly and and angrily which was he had a big temper eisenhower he the image of him is this sort of as i said this avuncular kindly older guy you know who's just just taking care of business but no he was a ferocious fellow and uh, did a lot of fighting with Joe McCarthy, with uh, Douglas MacArthur, with all kinds of people who came along, of uh, Orville Faubus being uh, one of them, Khrushchev being another. Um, and he was a tough guy, but who always had foremost in his mind the good of humanity, what he could do for good, for people, to better their lives, and not just his base. Not just, you know, he wasn't a Republican. He could have cared less. He ran as a Republican because he was trying to combat uh, Robert Taft. Um, but he was ready to run as a Democrat uh, against um, MacArthur had he gotten the GOP nomination. So he wasn't a partisan uh, like we now think of Republicans and Democrats as these Montagues and Capulets, you know, who are just as happy to see each other die as do anything to help the citizens of the United States. Yeah, well, the television networks are the same way. I mean, the news outlets are all are, are Montagues and Capulets as well. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It, it, absolutely. It, 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 it's horrifying. As an actor, I'm sure you're used to getting energy back from whoever else is in the scene with you. How much do you then rely on the audience as sort of your partner when you're doing a one man show? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't done it for an audience yet. I'm scared. Uh, I'll uh, I'll use a nasty word, shitless, because um, yeah, you know, theater is a very very living live enterprise, and I've been in many 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 plays and musicals, big ones on Broadway and little ones in little tiny theaters. And sure, stuff happens, you know, somebody throws up in the third row, uh, you know, your your partner, I once was on stage on Broadway and just two of us and uh, the lady opposite me, we had a big long scene coming up and she just went and left. And I was all alone on stage. <clears throat> I saw her in the wings go into her dressing room and I said, oh, well, and I sat down on this bench that was there. And fortunately in that play, <clears throat> pardon me, fortunately in that play, we didn't have real props. We, we pantomimed everything because it was a play about deafness and sign language. So we were both using our hands all the time, signing, 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 signing. So 
there was there were no props on the stage. So fortunately, I picked up the non-existent telephone. I dialed a number and said, Dad, it's James. And I had a long conversation on the phone with my father, who was not a character in the play, but had been talked about. So he existed in, you know, in the in the backstory. And while I was sort of casually glancing into the wings to see if my partner was ever going to come back on stage, I had this long conversation with my father. And some of it was me just listening and then going, well, how can you say that? That's not true. And I, the audience didn't know what he was saying, nor did I, but I was just buying time. So, I mean, I've been in weird situations and I've been in situations where I myself yeah, forgot, even if it was the 800th performance of something, you know, you get distracted, you get a weird thought, something goes on out in the audience, a fire engine goes by, and you just have that momentary thought of, wow, I wonder what's burning. Uh-oh, where am I in the play? And you don't know, but yeah, there's the other person, and there's, there's, sometimes there's music. You figure it out, you get out of it. But I've never been literally alone on stage, all by myself, with almost two hours of monologue to deliver. And if I suddenly hit a, a, you know, one of those black holes, one of those brick walls, I will do what I always do and I'll just start talking. I'll start making stuff up until I figure out where I'm supposed to be. But the risk exists that that happens and that I don't save myself elegantly, that maybe I skip six pages and, oh yeah, here's where I am blah, blah, and I start back in the play, but uh-oh, I've left out a whole bunch of stuff. And do I try to now double back and get that stuff in, or do I just finish and we go home early? Anyway, I'm confronting all of that in a matter of, well, a day or two. Is that part of the appeal of doing this? Doing uh, something that scares you on a certain level that has that element of risk? To be really honest with you, no. I'm an old guy. <laughs> I like having a piece of work in my hands. I because I owe that to the audience. The audience isn't there to see me, you know, get out of trouble or and you know how deft can I be at solving some disaster that happens. That's not why they're there. They're there to hear a play about Dwight Eisenhower and hear this actor portray him and, and see what it's about. That's why they're there. And I owe them the best version of that that I can possibly deliver to them. That's true of any play. That's true if you have, you know, four lines in an otherwise huge play and that's all you got to do. Those four lines are your thing and you owe it to the audience to be there and give whatever it is that it requires. A song or a silly joke or just, you know, the, the dinner is ready, you know, you got to mean it, you got to be there. So um, I feel a tremendous responsibility. And so no, the part that scares me uh, is not fun. I don't enjoy it. And I work, 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 work to make it less and less probable that there will be any of those really bad moments. I, I hope there won't be one. I, I'm sure there won't be. Oh, I'm sure there won't be. I wish I shared your sureness. <laughs> I, you know, I've seen you on stage too many times. You're a pro. I'm not, I would, I, as an audience member, I wouldn't go in concerned. Mm. Well, good. I'll, I'll keep that thought in my mind. <laughs> good. You know, presidents have been fodder for plays and musicals, you know, <laughs> for quite some time. I mean, even, even you go back to, to Shakespeare's time. I mean, you know, good. monarchy, et cetera. Why do we why do we put on a pedestal these kind of characters and how much can a play do to bring them back down to earth and make mm. them more relatable as human beings? Well, I think, you know, not being a licensed psychiatrist, but nonetheless, acting in, includes and involves a lot of psychological delving into, well, why does this character act or say this? what is going on and you do a lot of that thinking so 
I think we are like moths to a flame, attracted to power. To the degree sometimes, you know, Freudians will always say, well, it's because it's what you lack that you seek in the outside world to sort of bolster you and help you feel stronger and more ready to take life on. Not, a, not an easy task, you know? I mean, I'm now 75, I've lived all these years gone through so much, raised five children, had this multi sort of faceted career, uh, you know, uh, wonderful things have happened to me, terrible things have happened to me, like anybody my age. And uh, it's a big deal, life. And so when somebody shows, either somebody you know, it could be your father, it could be your mother, it could be your brother, your sister, or a dear friend, or somebody you don't know, a president, a, you know, a CEO of some giant corporation, uh, whoever, baseball player. And you see a confidence, you see a, a control over life, at least in, in some big or small way, that you don't feel you have or you wish you had, or you're trying to learn how to have, but you don't, they do. And that's attractive. That's, that's something you want to be like them. You want them in your life, whether it's personally, you know, sometimes it's romantic, a strong woman, you know, attractive, a, a strong man, sexy. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it can be very, very uh, small and personal, or it can be voting for somebody like, let's say, the, our former president, whose name I can't, I can't say without blistering my tongue, but um, a guy who seemed, who made this fake aura around himself of power and success. And that stupid show he had on TV where he said, you're fired. People thought, oh man, there's a guy who has, he's got life where he wants it. He knows what he's doing. You know what? I saw his name bigger than 10 feet high in gold letters on some building I just drove by. So he must really know what the hell he's doing. And he becomes attractive to people and even to the degree of being elected president. So one's attraction to strong individuals and rulers and leaders is understandable and often justified, but also often uh, mistaken. Well, and and given given what you said earlier about him, you know, choosing to be a Republican because that was the best path for him, not right. because there were, not because of ideology. Do you think he would even recognize the Republican Party today? I mean, it seems like Eisenhower was a man about country first. I think he. I don't know about the word recognize. No, I mean, but he, even in the play and in the stuff I've read uh, and seen about him, he was extremely aware of those tendencies in whatever group, like in a party, in a political party, in a country, in a continent. He dealt almost hand to hand with Adolf Hitler. He saw what happened in Germany. He was alive during World War I and during the years in between, which is when the, the rise of communism and fascism in Italy and in Germany and communism in Russia and, and later in China, he saw all that taking place. So a very right-wing quasi-fascist movement that we're experiencing in the United States right now he would have been horrified, but in terms of just the word recognize, he would say, yep, there they are. This time they got through. In my day, we beat them down. But here it is 50, 60 years later, they, they broke through the surface. And I've done a lot of reading about it. And the reason, one of the many reasons that, that there is this gigantic upsurge of right wing, uh, politics and fanaticism, both, because it's not all fanaticism. 
but it definitely isn't all politics either, um, is a, a planned and executed set of circumstances planned and executed by some of the richest people in the country. Now, I sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I, I've read books about it where, where all the evidence and all the, all the, uh, the facts are indisputable. They just said, hey, the people of this country are never really going to want the kind of government that we, powerful, rich, whoever we are, people want. They don't want the rich to pay zero taxes while making billions and billions of dollars. They don't want their wages to go down as ours go up. They don't want their unions to be weakened, if not gotten rid of. No, they like their unions. They don't want to have to have mother and father both working two jobs and farming their children off to some daycare center when they're six months old because they need to work. Because if they both don't work those two jobs, they can't put food on the table. They don't want that. But that's how we get this rich. That's how our corporations keep buying back their stock. That's how we get another bonus. We make another 10 million, another 40 million, another 50 billion. That's how we do it. We do it by weakening their unions, by making them work for lower wages. To hell with them. We don't care. But the people of this country are never going to go along with that. So how do we get it? How do we get that? Well, they started from the bottom up and they started indoctrinating people who were going to colleges, young lawyers, training them in this sort of capitalist, gone on steroids view of, of wealth balance. And they got them into all the local judgeships. And then they got them into the appellate courts and the federal courts. And now they have six of them on the Supreme Court. And look what's happening. But it's been a project. It hasn't been accidental or emotional. It was a thing established. We can't get it in the votes. We got to curtail the votes. We got to prevent people from voting because the more people who vote, the less votes we're going to get. So if we smash them down, make it impossible, throw votes out, make it difficult, we will win. We will win. And they are and they have and it's working. And I'm sad that. I will be gone by the hopeful time that that it changes back. But I believe it will. I I hope it happens a lot sooner than that. I didn't mean to go on a political rant, but that's hey, all right. I about presidents and well, power. Well, welcome to the Rachel Maddow show. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's go from a charlatan to the son of Charlemagne just for a moment, <laughs> which I didn't plan on using that word play. That was good though, but it worked. Lovely. Um, did, did the word charlatan maybe come from Charlemagne? I don't know. It, it's possible. It very well could. You know, very well could. But that's a pretty auspicious way to to launch your Broadway career by being in Pippin. Um, and obviously, you were working with Bob Fosse. A lot of people know Fosse from the FX series Fosse Verdon. Oh, that's too bad. Yes, I know. And that's, you know... I sort of, I can't, I never met Bob Fosse. I would love to because I was an enormous fan, but I can't imagine, frankly, that he got it late as often as he did if he was as miserable as he was depicted on that on that show. So rather than argue the merits of Fosse Verdon, what do you remember most about working with Bob Fosse? Well, I, many things, of course, but, but uh, he was smart, smart as a tech. And his smartness involved many things. He was very literate. You know, he had read a lot of stuff so he could talk about history. He could talk about literature, but I'm not, not that kind of intelligence is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a, a showbiz theatrical vision and sm smart analysis of mostly of audiences rather than only on the theatrical event, the dancing, the steps, the choreography, of course, that was his specialty and his own dancing was amazing. 
but his choreography and how he passed that on to his dancers was also fantastic. And, and so that was definitely a, a very theatrical vision. But in here with him, it was always, what does the audience want, need right now? What do we show them and what do we not show them? And how do we get it across so that it's clear, funny maybe, sexy often, uh, serious, moving, meaningful? How do we get that? How do we do that for them? And he, the fact that his mind was so focused on the audience was very, very um, inspiring and instructive. Uh, and I loved it. I, it, it. It was very different from directors I'd worked with even as a young man before that, and many since, whose focus, even very brilliant, very creative, you know, I'm not disparaging anybody, but it's very much on the work, what we do here. And I feel their back is to the audience and they're looking at the stage and they're doing what they're doing for their vision and for what it is. Whereas Bob was doing that, always, always aware of the people in the seats. And that made his, his work snap and sizzle. And, you know, that, that was his part of his genius, I think. Obviously you've done other musicals. Um, you were in Ragtime, you were in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But what I think a lot of people don't know is that you actually wrote incidental music for a Neil Simon play called The yeah. Fools, directed yeah. by Mike Nichols. Yeah. So overall, what role does music play in your life? And is composition something you still do? I do, but not as often as I used to. You know, I, I, I've always been raising children and never have hit the big time in terms of the big bucks. So I'm a journeyman actor, and I've been sort of treading my way through this very, very competitive and tough business since I was a teenager, um, and still am. Nothing much has changed. Um, and uh, I took piano lessons a lot when I was a little boy, and my father was a great pianist, and so there was music in the house. It was part of our blood, part of our lives. Not even part, it was our lives. Music was it. Um, and I discovered theater because I went to a school that had a lot of theatrical stuff going on. Now, it wasn't a professional acting school of any sort. It was a very stiff, private, you know, boys school in Manhattan run by British uh, teachers. And it was, but they took their dramatics and their public speaking and their poetry learning and all that stuff very, very seriously. So that and living in New York, uh, going to the theater in the days when you could afford it, which you can't now. Um, on my allowance, I could go to a Broadway musical any time I wanted to, if I could get in. And uh, and so I saw everything in those sort of what are sometimes called the golden Broadway years from the mid 50s, 55-ish, to the mid 60s. 64 is when I came back to California to go to UCLA. I was born in California, but I moved to New York when I was in, in uh, third grade. Right. So, uh, so I had that sort of backlog of of uh, of theater all the time, but music was still this sort of the blood coursing through my veins. So I was writing little songs when I was in <clears throat> in high school. We would do little skits and stuff, and then when I got to college. And we were doing sort of big productions of plays at UCLA. I started writing incidental music for the plays. I was the guy who played the piano. So they'd say, hey, John, I'm doing better. I need music for it. Will you do it? And I said, mm, OK. And so I would put together music sometimes on the piano. And then I started learning instrumentation. And I wrote a musical. And I orchestrated it for a little band, a trombone, a trumpet, a flute, a clarinet. I had to learn about their ranges and how they blended. <clears throat> and then one uh, young lady that I went to school with, who was above me in grade, went on and became a producer um, with Roger Corman, who was a big producer of sort of B movies. And he gave her her own movie to produce. He funded it, but it was her production. Shot it in Ireland. It was a, a cute story with Milo O'Shea. and uh, She came back 
having spent all of her money. And she didn't have a score. So she called me up. I was the guy from school who always wrote incidental music and musicals. So she said, hey, John, can you score a movie? I said, I don't know. Yeah. And so I did. And I wrote it for a relatively small band because it was all we could afford. Again, a lot of uh, woodwinds and brass, no strings. And I played the piano in it to sort of fill it up. And uh, that was my first movie score. And then I went on from there and did some very big movies and, and uh, loved it. And I had those two careers going. Whoever hired me got me, you know. If I was scheduled to act in a television show and I got an offer to write a score, I had to say, no, I can't do it. I'm doing this. But the moment that was over, if somebody offered me a score, I'd said yes. And then they said, hey, but we want you to be on this show acting. I said, can't do it, writing a score. So it just went like that, you know. So there were periods where I wrote way more music and other periods where I did way more acting. But it sort of balanced out. Well, maybe it's time for, you know, your own your own At Liberty type show where you can showcase all of it, not just the shows you were in, but the music you wrote. No, I don't. I don't Sweet. think I'll ever do that. No. <laughs> Come on, you, you don't think you'd look good in those same, you know, black stockings? Well, and maybe. Black, and just a yeah. white, just a white blouse. That's right. I could pull that off. I think. <laughs> yeah. I have well, to do something with the hair. I've <laughs> shaved all my hair off for Eisenhower, um, but uh, yeah. Of course, it's very fashionable now too. Yes, so. it is. Yes, it's okay. So it's, it's good timing to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me conclude by asking you about something that I saw that Richard Hellison said in an interview in 2013. Oh. And he was talking about how American popular culture in general has changed in that it overpraises the new, the hot, the thing that's that's up and coming as the salvation of art. And his response was, there are things you do not know, questions you cannot ask, abilities you haven't yet refined until you've hiked a pretty good distance up the mountain. With all due respect, you've hiked a pretty good distance up the mountain at this point. How have the collective experiences you've had in your career make you both the actor and the man you are today? Oh my gosh. Um, well, that that's a hard one to answer, honestly. Uh, you know, no matter how old or young you are, you are the sum total of what you've been through that far. You know, that's true when you're two years old. Um, the words you have, the, the habits you form, the things you love and the things you hate. When you're two, you, you have a lot of experience already and you have a lot of feelings and opinions and you are formed by them as well as by people telling you, here's what you got to do. Okay, you know. When you get to my age, those are just multiplied by, you know, hundreds of people you've known and met and lived with and, and experienced life with and through them. Seeing children being born and, and watching them grow up and participating in that process uh, for better or for worse. Um, you know, and then all these professional engagements of different kinds. Um, I guess the, the the word that jumps to mind, and I, I I don't feel that I'm lying, is humility. You learn humility. You don't necessarily become, you know, just all grateful all the time, but you learn a, you learn strength. You learn how to trim the fat how to cut out of your own approach to life and to work. The weak parts, the, the, the doubtful parts, you, you, you trim those, you see how they don't work. Time after time, I wanna do this, I feel that. No, that's not helping. Don't do that anymore, do this. Oh, that worked, okay. So you hone, you, you, you know, just by by process, not on purpose necessarily, not not methodically, but after decades and decades, you get to a place where you sort of know who you are, for better or worse. You don't like a lot of yourself, but you're able to accept it and maybe counteract the parts of yourself that you know are going to get you in trouble or going to 
going to hurt you or people around you. And, um, and that creates a sort of a humility. You just say, okay, I'm lucky to be here. I'm so lucky to get to know all these people and work with them or live with them, marry them, love them, raise them. And, uh, I'm I'm glad I'm here and and uh I'm going to make the best of it that I can and not just for myself but try to try to do something good for other people um even if it's just acting on a stage and giving them something that that lifts them that makes them think differently than they thought as they walked into the theater and also you know trying to trying to get the word out there about about uh, about politics and about people and try to contribute whatever little bit I can to help the country move forward, not just me and my family and my career, but this country, the world now, it's about the world. It's not just about the US, it's about the planet. So, yeah, well, that was I'm a humble in front of the task of living a long life. Well, that sounded very presidential and a great way of ending our conversation. <laughs> and I meant presidential in the best possible way, not as <laughs> as as evidenced by debates and all the other non noise that goes on out there. Yeah, we sure up for it now, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Absolutely. I have really enjoyed this, John. Thank you very much. Me too. Thank you so much. Your questions were were very tough. But uh, interesting to, to think about and try to give answers to. I'm not sure I successfully answered all your questions, but I, well, I, th I think you did a damn fine job.